Welcome back to Femrear Canine Training, and this is going to be another Q and A episode where you're asking your dog training, behaviour questions, or anything within the canine realm whatsoever. You ask them to Rachel. Rachel picks the questions at random and then asks me. Now, before we dive into that Q and A, if you are new here, by the way. My name's Will, I'm a canine behaviourist, and I'm the founder of FemreaCanineLeaders.com. This is my wonderful wife, Rachel. But anyway, um, without further ado, we've got some questions. questions. We've got we've some got questions. questions. Let's dive into some questions. You ask the first one, and I am ready <laughs> and eager. Okay. I'll ask a personal question first, because someone did ask this. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, not, nothing like that. <laughs> Just someone asked, how excited are we about our English Mastiff puppy? Oh incredibly excited. So excited we need to share some of the videos so obviously i've been i've taught i've been talking to the breeder at length and he oh, said i've had to... a lot of questions about that as well Have you? when are you going to be sharing this so i've got lots of videos of mum and dad and obviously with the lockdown at the minute it's the the, the breeder we've already talked about this is over in italy so we're going to have to ideally i was going to go over because i've got pick of the litter to do the temperament selecting to choose the pick of the litter, then come home. And then when the puppy's ready, go back to then drive it back. Now, looking that touch wood, we're definitely gonna be able to go and pick the puppy up. That's no issue. Whether I'll be able to go and do the temperament selection, mm. it might just be a little bit too soon. So the, the breeder's been sending me loads of videos and trying to explain his opinions through video form, be doing loads of FaceTime calls and stuff, and I've got them all saved. So we will do a video at some point, yeah. introducing the breeder a little bit more. But let's get into the actual questions. But yeah, very excited. I imagine We're you're excited. excited. Nerve wracking, puppies are hard work. Even as a professional, I'm not shy to admit they are hard work. So the first question is, my nine week old Cavapoo doesn't pay attention long enough or is too giddy to teach obedience? It's not really a question, it's a statement, but okay. you know. I can get the question that's inferred from a statement What like do they that. do? What should they uh, do? Um, yeah, I'm gonna go the tough love approach. It's nine weeks old, what do you expect? All dogs are different. Cavapoos are high energy dog breeds. Yeah. Again, this is where I always encourage people that you should do your research beforehand and have realistic expectations of your dog. I could have told you that this is what a Cavapoo would be like at nine weeks old. Now that offers no solution to the problem, but for everybody else watching, um, I think that's an important lesson for you to learn. Now going back to the person specifically asking this question and then to help other people that might be in a similar situation, um, a nine week old puppy is completely expected to have a very small attention span and find it very difficult to pay attention or to do any obedience work. Perseverance. Yeah, perseverance is completely key. Now when it comes to, for example, my perfect puppy course that is, I would highly first of all suggest you go in and check in that out because maybe you're already following that and you're struggling with some of the areas because you're not getting the attention span. But I would suggest you go back and watch the earlier modules again because we talk about the importance of understanding the overarching theories and principles so that you can adapt it to your needs um, and it doesn't have to be such a regimented disciplined thing that you're falling behind because you're not whatsoever mm -hmm. and I do talk about a be if there was an area of raising a puppy that can wait it's obedience however all most people want to do is obedience and they feel like if they haven't got their 10 week old dog doing sit down stay roll over that they're failing and that's not the point whatsoever. What I would suggest to you is that if your dog is very high energy um, and it's struggling with its attention span at the minute, then you need to be focusing on manners and socialization and leadership. And through that leadership and through that manners, you can start to naturally demand higher levels of attention. And again, through the puppy course, we talk about the demands that we have in terms of our rules and boundaries and expectations, which therefore means if they want access to something that's positive, they have to give you your attention. And then off the back of that attention, you can then start to layer up some of the obedience work. But the overarching principle really is just to not slack off, but just relax. It's only nine weeks. You've only had the puppy for a week. You've got years to work on all the obedience. What you haven't got years on is to capitalize right now on socialization and to instill 100% consistent and enforced rules, boundaries, and insist on impeccable manners. They're the things you can be working on. Uh, and another little tip, obviously you have to be careful with young puppies, is tire it out. A tired dog is a happy dog, and a tired dog is a dog that's much easier to work with. So if it's really skittish and looking all over the place and wanting to play, well then go outside, 
play with the dog for 10 15 minutes and then come back in and try again if they're still really painful and excitable and energetic go back outside play with them some more burn off some of that energy come back in and try again like i say it, it comes with the territory of the breed that you've got um and again back to the tough love you've made your bed and now it's time to sleep in it and you have a responsibility uh, to provide that dog with what it needs and right now it's a calm consistent leadership so remain calm get back to your consistency and with that consistency follow a routine plan and build things up slowly and surely and stop setting your dog up for failure you have unrealistic expectations now and because of those unrealistic expectations the dog is failing and you're getting frustrated if you had more realistic expectations you could achieve success and you could celebrate the success and then it'd be a wonderful experience it all comes down to your unrealistic expectations because of the breed that you chose and then the energy level that you temperament selected of your puppy okay and second question how to transition from a treat reward to a verbal reward Ooh, good question this has got multiple layers and you're gonna have to excuse me i might need to get my waffle crown out here do i need to move away how big a gesture are you gonna make? probably pretty big i'm gonna get pretty <laughs> passionate about this subject so what i always do is i could very easily right now i could spend 45 seconds and give you a very clever answer using fancy terminology of how you do it and you'll think that it's amazing and that i know what i'm on about and that you're going to go and do it and then it doesn't work and then you're like well now what so the reason i go around the houses and i get on my high horse and i waffle so much is because i think it's important that you understand the overarching theories of everything that we're talking about with what we're doing now one of the things that people fall into the trap of in terms of food rewards is that they get into a bribery relationship with their dogs and they go too much on relying on food they wait too long to remove the food and then they find themselves stuck in a situation where the dog will only do things for reward and if there's something that's more exciting and more pleasurable for the dog then they'll seek that which is where the dogs will ignore recall they'll ignore heel walk commands because it's more fun for them to pull and they don't really care about the chicken behind you to fix that issue you have to have strong leadership with your dog there's no amount of positive food-based training that will fix that issue if you've got good leadership with your dog and that you are a calm consistent leader and you've established those rules boundaries and expectations it's then very easy to remove the food from the situation because you use food to build that foundation layer of what it is that you're teaching them and then as soon as you've done that you start to remove the food so if, if every time they do a sit you're rewarding it with a food treat as soon as they've got that nailed and you know that they know what the term sit means you now have a expectation and a responsibility to ensure that that dog always follows that command so if they don't do it you then need to look at other methodology of simply bribing them to do it and if they don't do it it's because they're choosing not to do it and if they're choosing not to do it it means that they don't respect your authority and your leadership so like i say when i told you i was warning you that i was going to get on my high horse and go around the block because this is one of those things that it seems like a small topic but it's got huge wider implications of your relationship um, with your dog and the overarching happiness with your dog so it always goes back to being a calm consistent leader with a good relationship with your dog use food rewards and then once you've got it established sometimes use food sometimes use I was praise gonna say, would you then start to yeah. like maybe alternate and then so when you mark a behavior it. with a food reward to say yes i like what you're doing verbally mark it at the same time so as soon as the food goes in you can use good boy i like yes yes you'll see me do it in the videos where i'm working with dogs yes and then sometimes they get a yes and no food comes but they associate that term yes with the positive marker of i like that behavior please do that behavior more so you can layer up verbal marker and the the food marker for the desirable behavior and then slowly you remove the the food marker and you're left with just the verbal marker and then you can slowly start to remove the verbal marker because through your leadership and 100 percent consistency to rules and boundaries and enforcing that if i ask you to do something i'm asking you for a reason and you need to do it please you then don't even need to add in any verbal markers they just do it because they respect you and it's yes no worries boss looking to you for guidance and direction what do you want me to do in this situation yes i know what that word means i'm more than happy to do it okay and obviously i guess it's different depending on the breed so if you've got a really 
I don't want to say easy to train, but you, do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like a food driven dog. A food driven dog. So like Sully, for example, yeah. you only sort of have to do things with him a few times and mm. then the food reward doesn't need to be there. Yeah, but, but that's, that's some not necessarily dogs it'll because take of the breed. A... That's because of our relationship with Sully. So right. we use the food reward to teach him that thing that's new. And then he's yeah. like, I've got that. That's awesome. Hey boss, when can we work more? When can we do this more? And the reward intrinsically is working with me as a leader. That intrinsically is the reward as opposed to me bribing you to do something you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. What Sully wants to do is work with me because I am his calm and consistent leader. So by just giving him the opportunity to work with me is in itself the reward. Now, to but dismiss what if you breed, haven't got a working dog? So just to dismiss breed in that conversation entirely isn't true. Yes, Sully is a driven food dog, so it makes that initial teaching of the thing easier. If you've got a very independent, confident, self-assured breed, we're talking livestock guardians like Kangles, that are very comfortable Tibetan Mastiffs, confident in making decisions for themselves and not having to seek guidance and direction, you then have to be an even better skilled canine leader to ensure that relationship. So for me, the breed differences more comes in the ease of building that relationship, but the outcome of the relationship is the same regardless of the breed, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, so again, I could talk about this for hours because again, I think it's one of those things that modern day training methods and this world of positive only, and I support positive reinforcement wholeheartedly, but I think people have swung too far and they've found themselves in this bribery relationship with their dog because they've lost the relationship and leadership with the dog that can be achieved with positive methods. But people think that the positive food marking is the be all and end all, which is why so many people come to me with behavior modification and rehabilitation requests after going to six positive only people because their only solution is to bribe the dog. And let's talk about reactivity as a classic example. Mm -hmm. We want to, when there's no distractions around, it's very easy to use food rewards to get a dog to heal, no problem. There's another dog on the other side of the road. That dog is now more interesting to that dog than the piece of hot dog is. And what you'll often find is that they might go, okay, thanks for the hot dog. And then they go straight back to that behavior. And the analogy I always use in this circumstance is if our son Dexter got a Sharpie and was going towards the, the wall to draw all over the Sharpie, I'm not gonna get a 20 pound note out. And come here. If you come away from the wall, I'll give you this £20 note and you can go to the shop and buy some toys. I'm going to have a balanced approach to how I handle that. I'm not going to go over and clatter him around the back of the head either. Yeah. I've never laid a finger on any of my children and never will. But I have a balanced approach to correcting bad behaviours and yeah. praising the good ones. But before I get off on my high horse anymore, because I could talk about that subject for hours, I hope there was enough there, wasn't there, for kind of, of the course, overarching... Yeah. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Like I say, I fully support positive approaches, but in the right situation, in the right circumstance, and then you should be able to remove that food reward very quickly. If you can't, then it's a clear telltale sign that there's a there's an issue with your relationship and that's what you need to fix as opposed to finding some solution to be able to remove the food so i hope you enjoyed that if you did hit the thumbs up button if you are new here and you like these q and a's make sure you subscribe this channel is gonna we're gonna keep doing these q and a's until we get our new puppy and then when we get the new puppy it's going to be like what it used to be where i'll document the experience of how as a canine professional i train my new mastiff breed a breed that is renowned for being very difficult to train i'm going to show you that any breed regardless of their characteristics and temperament can be a perfect canine companion and we're also going to maintain these q and a's alongside that so there's lots of really good stuff coming on this channel and i'm very excited about it and i'm honored that you're still here listening to me bang on about all this stuff so thank you very much and we'll see you on the next episode of the femoral canine training